This setup, a pair of FLIR Blackfly cameras worth about 1300 is tracking my car motion in real time, and the tablet is monitoring the path. These days, autonomous navigation looks quite effortless. With open source tools like MIT's Chimera VIO and NVIDIA's Isaac Sim, it seems anyone can build a self-driving system just a few GitHub clones away. However, once you try to move from a clean dataset or simulation to a real world, everything falls apart. It's not because you don't understand slam or fancy jargons like sure compliments. Instead, it's because your camera setup is garbage. Your robot hardware reality doesn't match the simulation dream. So, I decided to test a few stereo camera rigs on my car, and I finally built a setup that actually works in the real world. I mean, it's not perfect at the moment, but it is quite robust. I build autonomous systems for my living, and I believe the robots deserve the real world data, not just simulated perfection. In this video, I'll show you how to bridge the gap. Because if you're serious about autonomous systems, this is where the real learning begins. Hi, my name is Elliot. This is what I do every day. So, how do you escape the robot simulation world and get back to the reality, the real world autonomous navigation? Well, step one order the cameras. I grabbed a few 210fps USB cameras from AliExpress. Let's open them up and see what we got. While I was waiting for the delivery, I got a little too excited, so I cut up some aluminum profiles and designed the stereo camera rig in CAD. Then I 3D printed the parts. Because for 3D visual navigation, your robot needs to see depth. It needs to perceive the world in 3D, so I wanted to be ready before the Santa's gift showed up with the package. Since I already had most of it prepared, assembling the 3D perception camera rig was pretty straightforward. I plugged the cameras into my laptop, wrote a quick Python script with OpenCV, and voila, they worked. After a bit of lens focusing, I could finally see the camera in real time. Now, all that left is getting the 3D depth information from these cameras. Wait, how do I actually get the depth data? Where's the manual? The setup guide? Anything? Um, yeah, there's nothing. Time to dig deeper. When I close one of my eyes and try to align the two fingers, it's surprisingly challenging. And most people think it's our biology, however, it is not. Instead, it is about the geometry. If you ever tried out MIT's open source Chimera VIO, you'll find a mysterious file filled with strange looking numbers. These numbers are camera parameters. The focal length fx and fy for x and y axis, and the optical centers for cx and cy. I personally believe these numbers account for at least 50% of the visual navigation performance. And here's why. The cameras, just like human eyes, are about the geometry. Here's a camera on the left, in front of it, I placed some yellow points in the simulation. As I adjust the camera parameters, the zoom level changes accordingly. But wait, how does the game engine actually render the 3D objects into the camera view? Well, it uses the exact same mathematical algorithms that power robotic 3D perception. Here's the full math that transforms a 3D coordinate on the right-hand side x, y, z, w into an image coordinate u, v, w on the left-hand side. For the simplicity, let's assume all these big and small w's equal to 1. By applying some classic engineering magic, everything turns zeros and 1, we get the camera projection matrix like this. And this sounds amazing, because if we can get the 3D points into 2D space, maybe we can just reverse the process to get the 3D coordinates back. Easy peasy, or is it? There's one unfortunate thing. Whenever you take the image, all the 3D information collapses to 2D plane, and that's because the camera primary matrix has rank deficiency. Therefore, the 2D image itself cannot recover the full 3D information back. And after the matrix operation, we have two linear equations and four unknowns, the big blue x, y, z, and w. So we can't back calculate the 3D coordinate. So, 
Does that mean the equation is unsolvable? Not really. There's still a way out. Remember, these two equations come from a single camera. Therefore, to solve it, simply add two more equations, or simply add one more camera to observe the same 3D coordinate with another camera. Add a second camera and suddenly you have enough information to reconstruct the 3D points. You have four equations and four unknowns and this is called triangulation. And that's why both our robots and us need the two cameras to complete the triangle. Therefore, this is not biology, it is the geometry. Every camera lens has distortion, no exceptions. The most common distortion types are barrel distortion, pincushion distortion, and tangential distortion. They sound fancy, but in short, they just bend your image in ways your robot definitely won't appreciate. Here's the problem. The 3D perception or apipolar geometry assumes the lens is perfectly distortion free. To fix the gap, we do something called camera calibration. If you're lucky, calibration unwraps your image, clean, crisp, like something out of perfect simulation. And if not, welcome to the rabbit hole. And here's my undistorted image. As a professional engineer, I can describe this with one highly technical term. Crap in, crap out. Alright, it's time to be honest, no more cheap stuff. Even though these are the same models, the same lenses, same CMOS sensors, the physical alignment is totally off. The build quality is just bad. The low quality manufacturing like this makes consistent image rectification almost impossible. So yeah, time to retire these. And with every throw, the budget fires. Goodbye, cheap cameras. When your stock goes down, do you buy more or do you sell? Well, sometimes I invest more. And that's exactly what I did here. I bought a more expensive camera, hoping this one would finally work. Meet Stereo Lab Z Mini, about $600, a proper stereo camera. No need to build anything, no 3D printing, no aluminum cutting, just plug and play. And the engineer lived happily ever after. Well, yeah, long story short, it didn't work. I didn't really check the spec carefully before buying. Here's the thing. The Stereo Lab camera uses a rolling shutter. The weird effect where everything looks choppy when it's moving too fast. And here's what Z Mini captured when mounted on my car. Yeah, this is another piece of crap for outdoor usage. Alright, hopefully this is the one. This is Fleer Blackfly USB camera, a serious piece of hardware with about $1,300, which is not bad. The stereo build process is pretty much the same as before. I'm doing it all over again, but this time with the proper gears. Cutting the aluminum profiles, 3D printing a new stereo rig. Each lens here is about $150 FA grade 6mm focal length. Precision optics, no more AliExpress surprises. I mount the lenses again, making sure everything is properly aligned. Hopefully, this time, these professional cameras work fine with the proper gears. Finger crossed. And here it is, the calibration time. This time, I use a charcoal board. Larger, faster, stronger. Finally, it's working. And it's actually measuring the 3D points in the environment, clean, stable, and real. This is what I've been chasing for weeks. However, this 3D point itself is not enough for the visual navigation in real time though. What are we missing? When people talk about 3D visual navigation, they often think the 3D depth camera is enough. However, that's only the half of the story. To estimate how the camera moves frame by frame or camera echo motion, you need something else the optimizer. And one of the most popular framework is called G2O. G2O comes from a research paper titled A General Framework for Graph Optimization. 
is a C++ framework widely used in robotics and computer vision for solving nonlinear least square problems. Basically, it helps refine and correct the estimated poses or states of a robot or camera over time. Mostly, it has a sure complement implemented for bundle adjustment. So, all you need to do is use them. What I really like about GTO is how simple and efficient it is. Imagine your robot moves from point A to point B to point C, and along the way, it observes some landmarks. Even if the robot trajectory isn't perfectly accurate, GTO can optimize all the poses together, minimizing the overall error. It's like untangling a messy ball of dress. Each iteration pulls the map and the motion a little closer to the reality. So, I built my own visual dimetry pipeline using G2O. Visual dimetry is all about tracking the motion of a camera by analyzing how the scene changes from frame to frame. I used G2O for optimization, rerun IO for visualization, and ISORIX2 for fast data transfer because honestly, I'm not a big fan of the full raw stack. And I also published a Python package for G2O called ubiquitous-g2pi. There were already a few out there including the original one, but none of them worked properly on Windows, so I fixed that. Now you can just run a simple PIP install GTO Pi, and it works both Windows and the few Ubuntu versions. If you'd like to go deeper into GTO or visual navigation in general, I've got lectures coming up. I previously launched Robotics 101, a course designed to help people break into Robotics field of autonomous systems professionally. It's built for engineers, researchers, and developers who want to sharpen their skills and build a solid foundation. The essential theories, the math, and the code that real robot is built on. Whether this is your first step into robotics or next big leap forward, this course will help you bridge the gap between the curiosity and the professional capability. If that sounds interesting, check out the link below, and I'll see you inside. Alright, it's time to put everything together. I mounted the straight rig on the windshield of my car with a suction mount, hooked up the Jetson Ori Nano originally from my drone, and I connected my tablet to monitor it in real time. This is my full DIY setup for visual diametry on a moving car. And within 5 seconds, I soon realized something important. I needed a keyboard and mouse in my car. But honestly, I didn't want to risk my life for YouTube. This isn't even for academic paper. There's got to be a safer way. So I switched it to my laptop setup. But then another problem hit me. The battery. It lasts maybe about 10 minutes. Yeah, I call this real professional field test. Now, let me show you today's arena. It's a simple loop, quick drive, short distance. The overall route should be looking like alphabet P in a way. Hopefully, everything holds up. And we are off. So, it works. But, goddammit, it's not tracking perfectly, and the tracking is choppy. Probably I didn't set up the sensitivity correctly before I start. Well, still, this time I'm actually happy, because the problem isn't the camera anymore, it's me. Even the camera didn't capture the tablet well. And that means when I finally come back and edit editing this video, I finally noticed something went wrong, so I went back, ran another test, and here's a post-processed test. Now this. This is exciting. You can see the visual dimetry pipeline is tracking the route of the car correctly. Again, it's not the perfect though, it got the pattern of the alphabet P. And this isn't slam, and it's not even visual inertial dimetry yet. But still, seeing this come alive from the raw camera data in real time feels incredible. The drift and small errors you saw are typical vision only navigation. I didn't even use any inertial sensors, just pure camera stream. And that's the kind of the point. So if you're getting to visual navigation, start with a high quality camera, solid lenses, and a large calibration board. It'll save your time, money, and most importantly, your mental health. Good luck.